Chapter 44 It Wasn't a Doll Ellen Danley's second piece of new evidence was found in handwritten lab notes prepared by the CID chemist Janice Glisson on April 20, 1971. It was a record of a blonde synthetic wig hair, 22 inches in length, found in a clear-handled hairbrush, CID exhibit E-323, that belonged to Colette McDonald. The appearance of this evidence raised all sorts of questions. If the CID investigators had known about E-323, wouldn't they have linked it to McDonald's description of the blonde-haired intruder? Was it overlooked, or was it a deliberate suppression of evidence? Wouldn't the jurors at McDonald's trial eight years later see the blonde fiber as relevant to McDonald's claim that a blonde-haired intruder was present at the crime scene? Wouldn't the presence of the blonde fiber, which was unmatched to anything else at the crime scene, have contradicted the claim made by the prosecution that there was no physical evidence at the crime scene in support of McDonald's account of what had happened? Christmas, 1993 My wife and I had again flown from Boston to Raleigh-Durham to spend another holiday with my mother-in-law and aunt. By this time, I had been bitten by the McDonald bug and had become friends with Harvey Silverglate, McDonald's appellate attorney. Silverglate had asked us to look for wigs in the Fayetteville area. I-95 joins St. Paul's in Fayetteville, but dotted along the old federal highway US-301, there is a series of pawn and resale shops. There is also a wig emporium called the Wig Outlet. I found that shopping for wigs over the holidays can be depressing, but we were determined to help with the investigation. Our goal? Find wigs made from saran fibers circa 1970. Since the FBI had claimed that the saran fibers were from one of the McDonald children's dolls and that wigs had never been manufactured from saran, it would be a significant piece of evidence, the proverbial black swan. It would be even more significant to find a black swan in the Fayetteville area. Ultimately, we were not successful. There was too little to go on. Helena Stokely had destroyed her hat, boots, and wig in 1970, and so there was no hope of matching the fiber found in Colette's hairbrush with Stokely's wig. All that we could hope for was to prove the FBI wrong, to prove that Saran had been used in the manufacture of wigs, and to prove that the length of the saran fiber, 22 inches, suggested that it had not been used in the manufacture of a doll. In 1993, Brian Murtaugh, the lead prosecutor, summed up his position on the E-323 fibers in a survey of the collection of fibers and hairs in the possession of the FBI crime lab. His argument was straightforward. There were several fibers found. One was a gray monacrylic wig fiber that matched one of Colette's wigs. The other, the saran fiber, was unmatched to anything in the house, but was presumed to have come from one of the children's dolls. The unidentified wig fibers were crucial to McDonald's defense because of where they were found and because they supposedly linked Helena Stokely, now deceased, to the crime scene. Two hairbrushes, a clear-handled hairbrush found on a sideboard near the kitchen phone and a blue-handled hairbrush found under Colette's body became important. The defense scenario alleged that at some point during the crimes, Elena Stokely, wearing a blonde wig, had answered the kitchen telephone in the McDonald residence. If actual unidentified human wig fibers, which did not originate from the McDonald household, were found in these hairbrushes, this would tend to corroborate Stokely's presence and would be exculpatory to the government's case. The presence of these blonde synthetic fibers was noted in the CID examiner's bench notes. However, they were never mentioned in the final CID laboratory report. They had never been disclosed to the defense prior to the 1979 trial. This fact, that the presence of the wig fiber was never disclosed to the defense, is mentioned in passing as if it had little or no significance. The wig fibers found in this hairbrush were analyzed with the following results. The blonde synthetic hair was found to be a saran fiber often used for doll hair. At far left is a blonde saran doll hair from the FBI reference collection for purposes of comparison. 
The gray mott acrylic wig fiber found in the hairbrush, far right, was found to match gray mott acrylic fibers from the blonde fall Colette was known to wear. The source of the blonde synthetic hair from the clear-handled hairbrush posed more of a problem. Again, the same microscopic optical and instrumental techniques were used, ultimately determining that the blonde synthetic hairs were composed of saran fibers. Due to problems in manufacturing and the physical properties of saran fibers, they are not suitable for human wigs. They do not look like or lay like human hair. Therefore, they are not used to make human hair goods. One of the main uses of saran fibers during the same time of the murders was for doll hair. These blonde synthetic hairs were very similar to the blonde doll hair in the FBI reference collection. In fact, the early Barbie dolls made by Mattel had hair made of saran fibers. Since the McDonald girls were known to have owned dolls with blonde hair, and since little girls are known to brush the hair of their dolls, it can be inferred that the blonde synthetic hair found in the hairbrush probably came from a doll belonging to the McDonald girls or one of their friends. Unfortunately, none of the dolls originally belonging to Kimberly or Kristen are available today for testing purposes. This article provides Murtaugh and FBI forensic analyst Michael Malone's argument in a nutshell. The fibers came from one of Kristen's or Kimberly's dolls, not from a wig. Since saran fibers were not used for wigs, including Stokely's wig, the fiber had to have come from a doll. Murtaugh's analysis, however, omitted a central problem. The blonde synthetic hairs were long, up to 24 inches, probably too long to have been used for a doll's hair. Enter the doll experts. On December 5, 1990, a couple of agents from the FBI, Malone and Raymond Butch Madden, and an assistant U.S. attorney, Eric Evenson, interviewed two doll experts, employees of the Mattel Toy Company, Judith Shizes and Melly Phillips. Both Shizes and Phillips told the government that Mattel had never made a doll with saran hair fibers as long as 24 inches, and Phillips told them that she was not aware that any other manufacturer was using saran in the making of dolls in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Shizes, according to a statement made later to McDonald's defense attorneys, recalled her initial meeting with Malone. They went to her home in Hawthorne, California, and viewed her collection of 4,000 dolls. We discussed generally the different types of synthetic fibers used to make doll hair, including saran, nylon, and kanekalon. The agents told me that they were interested in any doll or dolls made by Mattel or any other manufacturer which might have had hair 22 or 24 inches long. I replied that, to my knowledge, no Mattel doll had ever been made with synthetic fibers that long, and that one might possibly find a doll hair fiber that long if the fiber were doubled over in the hair rooting process to produce two 11 to 12 inch hairs, but that I did not know of such a doll. Shizes then gave them several doll collector's books to look at. Finally, the investigators revealed that they were looking for a blonde haired ballerina doll approximately 24 inches in height. Shizes knew what they were talking about. It was a doll called Dance Arena, sold by Mattel in 1969, and was in her collection. During the course of the interview, the agents told me that the defense was contending that the 22 or 24-inch saran fibers had come from a wig, and the agents told me that they simply wanted to show that it was possible for such a long fiber to come from a doll. I told the agents that while it was possible, it was not probable, because even if fibers of that length were used in a doll, it would be very difficult to pull out an entirely intact fiber because of the way the fibers are rooted, and they had witnessed how I had to use tweezers to carefully extract the intact fibers from the Pollyanna and Dancerina dolls. Shizes told the FBI that the Pollyanna and Dancerina dolls both had hair made from nylon fibers, and that none of the fibers were longer than 18 inches in total length. She then surveyed her own doll collection to determine whether any of her dolls had synthetic fibers as long as 24 inches. There were none. The fibers weren't from a doll. 
As Shizes had told the FBI, there was no dance arena doll with saran fibers longer than 18 inches. The Fourth Circuit disposed of all this in 1998. The evidence at issue is not truly exculpatory. It does not directly bear on the question of innocence, but rather provides some evidence to support the theory that the hairs found in the hairbrush came from a wig. Well, the Fourth Circuit, technically speaking, was correct. The evidence was not truly exculpatory. Without Stokely's actual wig, where was the basis for a comparison? Of course, the absence of the wig was a result of a failure by law enforcement to collect the evidence in a timely fashion. Before it could be collected, Stokely had burned it. The opinion continues. The overall weight of the evidence still suggests that the fibers most likely did not come from a human wig. Even if it is accepted that the fibers came from a human wig, however, this fact does little more to prove McDonald's claim of innocence because it merely provides some support for yet another theoretical possibility, that the wig fibers found in the hairbrush came from an intruder. In our most recent decision in this case, we stated, the most that can be said about the evidence is that it raises speculation concerning its origins. Furthermore, the origins of the hair and fiber evidence have several likely explanations other than intruders. The evidence simply does not escalate the unease one feels with this case into a reasonable doubt. This story might seem quite ordinary, except for an additional wrinkle discovered once again long after the fact. It was based on half-truths about the use of Saran. Information that Saran had been used in human wigs was in the FBI files, but was not disclosed to the court. That evidence had been withheld. Laurie Cohen in the Wall Street Journal provided an effective summary of these shenanigans. Was Mr. Malone accurately describing what FBI texts said about Saran? To find out, the lawyers requested all materials in the FBI's possession about the possible uses of the fiber. In April 1993, the Freedom of Information Act search turned up two books belonging to the Justice Department that said Saran was indeed used for wigs. One of the books was clearly marked as belonging to the FBI Crime Lab's own collections. Mr. Malone had made no mention of these in his affidavit, and the court had relied on the absence of any such materials in reaching its decision not to reopen the case. Was it actually impossible to make Saran in the toe form required for wig making? The McDonald lawyers obtained from National Plastics Products Company in Odenton, Maryland, a toe of blonde saran fibers that the company had once made, contradicting Mr. Malone's statement that saran couldn't be manufactured in this form. The McDonald defense team also located wig manufacturers and wholesalers who asserted that saran fibers were used in wigs in the 1960s and 1970s. Here is an important piece of evidence rejected by the courts that reveals the mindset of the police and prosecutors. The government investigators may have believed that the saran was not used to make wigs and that the 24-inch fibers came from a doll, but if so, why did they mischaracterize the evidence they had obtained from the doll experts? Indeed, the wig fiber evidence might never speak to Stokely's presence at the crime scene, but it did speak to the government's willingness to ignore information favorable to the defense. Laurie Cohen continues. Mr. Silverglade also learned that Mr. Malone had sought, but failed to get, a statement from a Mattel Incorporated doll specialist, Judith Shizes, that a 24-inch saran fiber might have come from a Mattel doll. Though Ms. Shizes says she told Mr. Malone and two of his colleagues that neither Mattel nor other manufacturers she knew used such long fibers, the government agents continued to press her, she says. You aren't trying to railroad this guy, are you? Ms. Shizes says she asked. She says Mr. Malone laughed and then responded, No, we know he's guilty, and there's a ton of other evidence to prove it. No, we know he's guilty. And hence the evidence has to be interpreted and selected to accommodate that fact. But what about all the other evidence that tends to disprove it? 
A couple of weeks after the visit, Ms. Shiza says she received a draft affidavit from federal prosecutors. It stated that Saran was the major fiber used for doll hair by Mattel and others until the 1980s. The affidavit also said that doll hairs could be doubled during the weaving process to reduce a 24-inch fiber into a foot-long hair. Disagreeing with both assertions, Ms. Shizes refused to sign. There was another problem with the FBI wig fiber analysis by Michael Malone. Nicknamed Agent Death, for years Malone was a go-to guy at the crime lab, one of the super sleuths. Malone's specialty was hair and fiber. Time and again, in cases with no eyewitnesses, no confession, and no motive, Malone would peer into his twin eyepiece microscope and come up with the evidence that helped send somebody to prison or death row. Malone quickly became a star. He grabbed headlines for his work in the fatal vision appeals of Jeffrey McDonald, the Green Beret Army surgeon convicted of murdering his wife and children at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He won praise for helping with the case against John Hinckley, who shot President Ronald Reagan. And Hillsborough County Sheriff's deputies credited him with finding the key evidence, tiny strands of fiber, that put away Bobby Joe Long, a Tampa Bay Area serial killer who tied up his victims before raping and strangling them. The more famous Malone got, the more eager police and prosecutors around the country became for his testimony. And in time, with all the glory Malone achieved came whispers, whispers that turned to murmurs, and then a steady buzz. Mike Malone was sloppy. He was a government shill. He stretched the truth, maybe even made things up. On May 21, 1991, Malone testified at the murder trial of J. William Buckley, the same day he prepared a second affidavit for the McDonald case. Buckley and an accomplice had been accused of murdering 33-year-old Kathy Wilson in a van. The only physical evidence was hair. It was sent to the New York State Police Crime Lab, but came back inconclusive. The prosecutor then asked Malone at the FBI to take a look at it. Malone testified that not only was there the very, very strong possibility that the hair was the defendant's, he also found one of the victim's hairs on a white blanket in the van that belonged to the accomplice. The only problem was, the New York lab had shipped the wrong blanket to the FBI. Even after he was confronted with this fact, Malone stood by his results. William Buckley was acquitted. But Malone's questionable cases kept piling up. Finally, in 1997, he and 12 other agents became the subjects of a Justice Department probe. It found 3,000 suspected cases of misconduct. Malone continued to work in the lab after his malfeasance was first reported. He retired in 1999, but that was after the Fourth Circuit had disposed of the blonde saran fiber issue once and for all. Melly Phillips died over a decade ago. But Judith Shizes, now retired from Mattel, still has her collection of over 4,000 dolls. I wanted to know if you could tell me about the people that initially contacted you with respect to the McDonald case. Are you trying to prove his innocence or that he's really guilty? There's little point in trying to prove he's guilty at this point, since he spent 30 years in prison. I know, it's so sad. And the only reason is because he won't admit to doing something that he says he didn't do. Do you think that's the only reason? In the long run, it comes to that, because they've said if he would admit to it, he could get out. And he said he wouldn't admit to it. And your own feeling? Do you believe he's innocent? I have no idea. I only know from reading the book and watching the movie. There are times you think, yes, he could have done it. And then there's other times you think, no. Well, you had suggested at one point that they were trying to railroad him. They were trying to prove it the fiber came from a doll, and the longest one that would have been for a doll at that time was 12 inches long. Well, there was a Dancerina doll, I remember. Dancerina, okay, it was a Dancerina. And they said, could it be longer? And I said, no. I said, when you're sewing, you go in the skull and then out, so up and down. So 12 and 12 is 24. And that's when they said, 
All right, we got him. I'm not sure I understand. When you're brushing a doll's hair, you're not going to get the roots because inside the scalp it's knotted so many times. You cannot pull out one strand. You'd have to loosen a whole section, and that's never going to happen. I showed them how it couldn't be done. I said, so you can see it's illogical. So if I understand this correctly, they claimed the hair could have been doubled over, or something like that. The claim they were trying to make was that it was not from a wig. It was from the daughter's doll, because they had hair on a brush, right? Yes. Okay, the daughter had used the hairbrush and brushed her doll's hair, and the hair came out on the brush, and the hair was twenty inches. I believe twenty-two inches long. Twenty-two. But they weren't concerned about the logic of it. When it's folded over, you can't pull out one strand. It can't be done. Unless it has been totally rooted wrong. And if they had the doll, the doll would have had bald spots where they pulled that whole section out. The material that they used for the doll's hair was the same material that was on the wig. The wig hair was something that was logical. Because they did make wigs out of that particular kind of hair, but they didn't make doll hair. They were just trying to prove that there could have been a piece of hair that could have been that long. And yes, it could have. But you think it's very unlikely? Have you ever tried to pull a doll's hair out and get one strand? My experience with doll's hair is limited. You're saying it doesn't work like that? No, it's going to snap off at the scalp. You're not going to pull one hair and get it to come all the way out. And you told the FBI this? Yes, they were very, very nice, but I said, I don't believe that it's a possibility. I said, I hate to tell you this because I don't believe it. I said, but I don't want to tell you this because I think that would be railroading him. And that's when they told me he definitely did it. And I said, are you positive? And they said, yes. They said they were positive. Yes, they said that they were positive and they had all this new information, and this would just be another piece of evidence that they had against him to prove that he was guilty. And that his father-in-law definitely knows he did it. The three of them told me exactly what they thought. They were quite positive he did do it. But like I said, it was tough because I would have to say I knew it wasn't a doll. Chapter 45 1-821-3266 1983. Stokely had confessed so many, many times. MacDonald saw four people in the house. Over the years, Stokely had named over a dozen people as her accomplices, but three names came up repeatedly. Greg Mitchell, her boyfriend who had recently returned from a tour of duty in Vietnam, Dwight Smith, and Shelby Don Harris. There was also Alan Mazarol, Kathy Perry, Bruce Fowler, and others. What about them? The question of other suspects came to haunt Ellen Danley and her father, Ray Shedlick. She sent me a videotape of a question-and-answer session between her father and Jeffrey Elliott, a professor of political science at North Carolina Central University, who was then planning a book on the McDonald case. Elliott later interviewed McDonald for Playboy magazine, an interview that was brutally direct perhaps because Elliot believed in his innocence. Elliot died in 2009, and his manuscript for the book, The Unabridged Interview, and thousands of pages of his notes can no longer be found. Some of his papers are in a storage unit or in a bookcase in his father's house. All that remains is the videotape and the Playboy interview with Jeffrey MacDonald. More Ghosts from the Past the tape is nearly five hours long. Elliot, off-camera, feeds Shedlick name after name, topic after topic, and waits for a reply. Meanwhile, Shedlick, in a white shirt and tie, in close-up in front of a wood-paneled wall, smokes, drinks water, and stares resolutely into the lens of the camera. The scene is flatly lit. This is a movie with limited production values, Shedlick presents his revision of the story that failed to convince the jury in 1979, Jeffrey MacDonald's story. If it weren't for a few minutes of jokes at the end, it would look like a hostage tape. 
Shedlick looks exhausted. He's a big malapropism guy. My favorite? Confibulation. That unmistakable combination of fibbing and confabulation. The tape begins with Shedlick's recollection of joining the case, and as if to prove his own bona fides, a summary of his own encyclopedic investigations recited without notes of any kind. Raymond Shedlick. I believed almost intently that Dr. MacDonald was guilty of these homicides. I live in a section of Long Island, which is probably two towns away from where Dr. MacDonald grew up. So, naturally, the local newspapers had a great deal of publicity about the homicides, and I read avidly of the case. At a certain time, from reading these stories, it finally added up in my mind that he was guilty. I knew also that in this type of investigation you have to be very, very independent, and I was concerned that I perhaps couldn't be independent because I had a predisposition to his guilt. I told Brian O'Neill, and I told Dr. McDonald ultimately that I would conduct his investigation independently. No matter where the chips fell, I would tell him exactly what I had found. So it was from that point, Dr. Elliot, that I commenced my investigation into the McDonald homicides. Jeffrey Elliott. How did you launch the investigation? How did it take shape? How did you go about cultivating witnesses, questioning them, and generating information which would either prove or disprove? The first thing I had to do was to gain legal status here in North Carolina, and that meant that I had to become a licensed private investigator. So I applied for my private investigator's license and secured that in March of 1983. I then proceeded to read every single document I could get pertaining to the McDonald case. The documents were interesting, but I needed witnesses to come forward. So I ran an ad in the Fayetteville paper, advertising the fact that we were conducting an independent investigation of the homicide of the McDonald family, and it wasn't very long after that I began to receive telephone calls. Some of them, of course, were crazy calls, and some of them were meaty calls. I had to screen out which ones were apparently from people who were obviously deranged from those that might have had decent information. The phone calls started coming in. The meaty with the crazy. The obviously deranged mixed in with significant leads. As part of his arsenal of techniques, Shedlick had assembled 25 photographs. There were 25 photographs. Among the photographs were pictures of Shelby Don Harris, Elena Stokely, and the rest of the group that we identified. Aside from that, there were look-alike pictures. There were only five alleged perpetrators, and there were twenty look-alikes. Shedlick recalled giving the photo group to Edith Boucher, a professor of English at North Carolina State University's extension program, who told him that she had seen a group of people matching the description of the killers approach Colette McDonald after her class on February 16th. The names go on and on, like a prison roll call. Sherry Dale Morgan, Reverend Kenneth Edwards, Frankie Bushy, Joan Green Saunderson, Marion Campbell. Carlos Torres, a retired army sergeant who was working as a bouncer at the NCO club the night of the murders. You can hear Elliot's off-screen prompt. Let's turn to Carlos Torres. Carlos Torres was a retired Army sergeant. On February the 17th, 1970, between the hours of 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, he was on his way home to Spring Lake. In order to get to Spring Lake, he had to go along Honeycutt Boulevard, and Honeycutt Boulevard would bisect with Bragg Boulevard. He made a left turn at Bragg Boulevard. Dr. McDonald's house, we calculated by footage, is probably about 150 to 250 yards from the intersection of Honeycutt and Bragg Boulevard. So Mr. Torres said that he came to the traffic light at Honeycutt and Bragg Boulevard, and he stopped. And as he stopped, his attention was drawn to the left of him. When the light changed and he made the left turn, he saw three people run from what is considered the grassy knoll of that area. Two of the people he saw were military types, and one was a hippie type. They came into vivid sight by the light inside the van. The grassy knoll. Which unsolved mystery is this? Once again, Elliot's off-screen voice and the name Dorothy Averett. Dorothy Averett was delivering the Fayetteville Observer early the morning of February 17th. She had seen Stokely days before the murders and then a second time early in the morning after the homicide. 
The second time, the girl who she identified as Stokely was covered in blood. She had been given a lead for a person who wanted to subscribe to the paper. It was in a trailer camp, the identical trailer camp that we have identified as the one Helena Stokely used to hang around in. When she arrived, she saw people that were drugged out. Men and women. Some people were vomiting. And she saw Helena Stokely because that was the name on the lead card, Elena Stokely. She went up, and she talked to her for a few moments, and she got back in the car, and she thought to herself that she would never deliver a newspaper here because she'd never get paid. Then, on the morning of February 17th, around 6 a.m., Averett had driven to a convenience store, Mrs. Johnson's Grocery Store, a few miles from where, and a couple of hours after, Micah had seen the woman with the wide-brimmed hat standing in the light rain. As she came close to the convenience store, she noticed a car parked. Two white men were sitting in the back seat, slumped. She parked the car, and she went into the convenience store. She noticed the girl whom she had talked to the week before, Elena Stokely, inside the convenience store. She said she looked like she was covered with blood. As she stopped to talk to her and asked her what happened, there was a black male who was getting a soda out of the soda case. He saw Ms. Averett talking to this girl, whom we identified as Helena Stokely. He hurriedly put the soda back into the case and grabbed this girl by the arm and said, Let's go, and went outside. Shown the photographs, she identified her as Helena Stokely, and in fact, she said she knew it was Helena Stokely because she had had business with her the week before. Shedlick takes a cigarette and inhales deeply. And then a sudden cut. The timestamp jumps an hour or so. The greenish cast in the video is gone. It's replaced with a bluish cast. Shedlick is back, smoking a cigarette and waiting. The video carries on. Elliot provides a name, Shedlick tells the story, and finally confirms whether the person named picked any of the suspects out of a group of photographs. Stokely herself was already dead by the time Shedlick got involved in the case, but he spoke to her former husband, Ernest Davis. Helena said she believed she was at the McDonald house the night of the killings. She wanted to speak to other people involved. Helena began to drink a lot. She became upset and angry and would get very violent at times. It seemed like at night she would actually relive that night because she would lie in bed and say, It's my baby. She would get up and she would wash her hands and be half asleep getting her hands clean. She told me she went to Dunkin' Donuts and washed her hands. They had blood on them. At times, Ernest recalls, Helena would come up with things that made you believe she was at the McDonald house. One day we were walking and there was a rocking horse sitting on the side of the road. She grabbed my hand and started crying. Look at the spring. She said that the spring on the kid's rocking horse was broken in the McDonald house. Another time she said there was supposed to be a fence around the back of one of the houses and a dog was inside. She told me she hated jewelry boxes because someone went into the McDonald jewelry box and got some stuff out. Ernest said Helena told him she went into the bedroom to keep the kids quiet. She came out, and McDonald was already stabbed, and his wife was screaming, and then she began to trip out. She said the next thing she remembered was standing there with the candle. She said everybody was scared. They dropped the weapons and left, with the exception of a pair of scissors. In his video interview with Elliot, Shedlick described his conversation with Ernest Davis. I asked him finally, why do you believe that Dr. McDonald is innocent, and why do you believe that your wife, your former wife, she was dead by then, was there? And his parting words were to me, I never pressed her, I never asked her for anything. Whenever she wanted to talk or tell me something, I listened. That's Ernie Davis. Then Shedlick stops abruptly on tape and waits for Dr. Elliot to feed him the next name. One by one. A legion of people, their statements committed mostly to memory. Addie Willis Johnstone, an older woman who saw a group matching McDonald's description wandering around Fayetteville soon after the murders. Marion Campbell and Frankie Bushy, who had seen Helena Stokely, Greg Mitchell, and a black man at Dunkin' Donuts early the morning after the murders. 
Campbell watched until the group took off in the direction of Fort Bragg. Chapter 46 In Bright Red One more confession. This time, not Stokely. Her ex-boyfriend, Greg Mitchell. In 1971, Ann Kennedy had been a volunteer at the Manor House, a Christian halfway house in the Haymount neighborhood of Fayetteville. She reported meeting a young man who went by the name of Dave, a blonde man, about five feet eight. The story was corroborated by two other volunteers, Juanita Cisneros and the Reverend Randy Phillips. Shedlick had all three statements read to a court stenographer and prepared a transcript. He told Jeffrey Elliott that story. I interviewed, first of all, Ann Sutton Kennedy. In 1971, she was involved with what she called the Manor House. Now, the Manor House was sort of a halfway house in Fayetteville, in the downtown district, where if you were a drug addict and you didn't have a house to go to, they would take you in. If you drank too much and you were homeless, the Manor House would take you in. Ann Sutton Kennedy was involved in that ministry and very interested in it. She's a born-again Christian. The story can be variously described, from Shedlick's tape and from a number of depositions. She told me of an incident that occurred sometime in August of 1971. She stated that one day a young man came into the manor house. They washed his clothes, and they had him share a room that night with the licensed minister, which was the Reverend... Elliot doesn't wait for Shedlick to come up with a name. He's on top of it. Randy Phillips... Randy Phillips. Now, on the Wednesday of that week, the whole group at the manor house went out to the suburbs of Fayetteville in Cumberland County to an old farm that they were refurbishing for the manor house for the purpose of having a country retreat, so to speak. This young man went out there with them and helped them work on the house. That Saturday night, they had a revival, a prayer meeting, where people were confessing to various crimes. Shedlick provides an account but Kennedy provided her own account of Dave's story. And he was there. And when it came time that he asked for prayer, he asked us to pray for him, there were several men gathered around him, and they were praying for him. And he began to confess. He began to confess that he had murdered. He began to confess using drugs. He began to confess all these things that were inside him and he became very emotional, asking God to forgive him for the things that he had done. It was as though he was just absolutely torn apart from everything right then. Because, I guess, you can just get so guilty, then you've got to do something about it. The next morning, Dave was gone, along with the clothes of the minister who shared his room. That evening, Ann Kennedy, Reverend Randy Phillips, and another woman, Juanita Cisneros, went to check on the farmhouse. They told similar stories. There's a little road that wound down through the pines to get to the old house. As we drove through the woods and got to the house, we had to turn our lights on because it was dark enough in the woods that we needed the lights from the car, you know, to see to get in there. And as we got there and drove into the circle where the big tree was, this young man ran out the back door, and there was someone with him. Juanita Cisneros we took a ride out there, and as we got close to the farmhouse, I remember somebody running out of the house, and it was like dusk. It wasn't quite dark, but it wasn't light enough. And the police were called, and when they came in, we went in to see what was in there. I didn't see his face, but his figure, his form, the form of his body, he looked like a young boy that had been at the manor earlier. Ann Kennedy. We had the key, unlocked the door, went into the house, and everything seemed okay the living room, and I walked through the door into the bedroom beside the living room, and there on the wall, written across, the walls were painted in off-white, we had just finished that room on Saturday, were the words, and it was written in red, and I don't know what he had used, what the person had used to write on the wall, but it was in bright red, and it said, I killed McDonald's wife and children. It was in four rows, but it wasn't written smoothly and evenly. It was written erratically across the wall, just slashed against the wall, and the red was sort of dripping down, and it just sent cold chills through my body. Juanita Cisneros. And there on one of the bedroom walls was written in, 
It looked like blood, but it could have been paint. Anyway, when you write with the brush, there were the words, I killed McDonald's wife and children. To me, at the time, it didn't mean anything because I didn't know who McDonald was. Chedlick asked each of the witnesses why he or she didn't come forward earlier. Juanita Cisneros said it wasn't that important to her. And Kennedy expected that asking a sheriff's deputy to make note of the painted words was enough. The deputy told her he intended to photograph it the following day. By the time Kennedy and others returned to the farm days later, the wall had been painted over. The farm stayed open for a year and a half until the manor house, which had been struggling financially, was forced to sell it. The building did not last long. And it was a very fine house. It was a very sad thing that it was destroyed. And had it not been destroyed, we could go there and scrape that paint away now, and those words would be written on that wall. Back to the video. Shedlick linked together the various statements. Each of the witnesses from the manor house was shown the 25 photos and identified Dave as Greg Mitchell, Stokely's boyfriend. Mrs. Kennedy picked out Greg Mitchell as being the person who ran away from the manor house, who confessed to the killing, and the one she saw running from behind the house in the country. I went and saw the Reverend Randy Phillips in Tennessee. He picked out Gregory Mitchell. I had Mrs. Cisneros come from Colorado to Raleigh. She remembered the full story as told to me by Mrs. Sutton Kennedy. When I showed her some photographs, she picked out Gregory Mitchell. So... Here we have a case of three independent witnesses testifying on a sworn affidavit that a subject who came into that house was in fact Gregory Mitchell, and the fellow who ran from the back of the house out in the country was Gregory Mitchell, and the writing on the wall was written by Gregory Mitchell. I interviewed Gregory Mitchell's wife. She gave me a sworn statement. She stated that to her knowledge, Greg Mitchell was in rehabilitation in Fayetteville in 1971. I tried to follow up on a couple of Shedlick's leads. When do you stop? Kathy Perry had been investigated by the CID in 1970. According to a statement later prepared by Peter Kearns, Betty Garcia, her landlady, described Perry as Caucasian, brown hair, about 20 years old, a hippie, and mentally unbalanced. Garcia claimed that Perry had been picked up by Fayetteville police for an alleged stabbing of a male in the spring of 70. That on 29 December 70, Perry was again involved in a stabbing incident wherein she allegedly stabbed another male. On about 30 December 70, Perry allegedly attempted to stab Garcia's son, and for this action, she made Perry leave her residence. Garcia claimed that Perry's relatives allegedly had her placed in a mental institution in Raleigh, North Carolina on that date. One male was stabbed sometime in the spring of 1970, another male on December 29, 1970, and then a third, Mrs. Garcia's son, on December 30th. She had also stabbed her pet dog to death sometime in the winter of 1970 while under the influence of drugs. With the dog, that makes four. According to a police report, the dog was stabbed until it was flat. When Mrs. Garcia threw her out, she turned over a pair of woman's knee-high white boots, personal papers, and photographs to a lawyer who in turn gave them to the CID. Kearns writes, A review of the items revealed that the white boots did not meet the description as furnished by Jeffrey MacDonald. No blood or debris of interest to this investigation was located on the boots. Hair from the brush was removed, and it was sent to the USA CID laboratory for comparison with those hairs found in the hands of Colette McDonald, and this examination proved the hairs to be dissimilar. And then Jackie Don Wolverton contacted the defense during the 1979 trial. A July 21st defense memo tells one more strange story. This morning, a Mr. Jackie Don Wolverton called the fraternity house. He said he wanted to talk to someone about the girl who allegedly was one of the intruders on 21770 involved in the McDonald murders. He told me there was a woman who had been living in a commune-type lifestyle in Fayetteville. 
For some reason, she asked Wolverton if she could live with him. He said it was okay. One night, the woman, whose name is Kathy Perry, attempted to kill him. All of these events are subsequent to the 2 1770 crime. When this happened, he said he went and got himself sewed up at the military hospital, that he had the girl admitted for mental evaluations, and that when he went through her belongings, he found the following. A blonde wig, a pair of white go-go boots, dirty, and an address book with Jeff McDonald's name and address in it. The statement included Wolverton's conjecture that the group of people that did this probably were out to get people in the special forces. Perry had denied any involvement in the murders to the CID when she was questioned in 1972. But the day before the airing of the Fatal Vision TV miniseries, November 17, 1984, she called the FBI and gave a detailed confession. She recalled that she had been picked up by a crowd of strangers on the night of the murders and that they had forced her to go with them to 544 Castle Drive, and that there they had entered into the McDonald house. Mayhem ensued. Perry advised that during all of this commotion the mother woke up once, but then went back to sleep. Perry said that she woke her up again and tried to get the woman to jump out the window with her. She said she also asked the woman for a gun because she said that the other people were going to kill them. She described the woman as being skinny and possibly being pregnant. A little while later, the dark-skinned, dark-complected male ordered Kathy to tie the woman up and to kill her. She said that she stabbed the woman several times in the leg and several times in the abdomen. After murdering the woman, she wrote in blood on the wall, Fuck you pigs from all of us to you. Her details were confused, often wrong. Murdered sons, not daughters. Not so surprising, given her history of male stabbings. She claimed to have written a sentence in the McDonald bedroom, but there was only one word on the headboard. All reported 14 years after the fact. And in 2006, she died. There was also Dwight Smith, at first, I couldn't understand why Dwight Smith had been discussed on Shedlick's tape, since he was one of the people mentioned repeatedly by Stokely. But when I called Smith, it was clear he didn't want to be interviewed. He told me, I'm not giving any statements, that's history, and I'll leave it alone. Stokely had implicated a good number of people, but claimed that she wouldn't say who was really involved until after she was given immunity. There is an important fact about detective work, often unacknowledged. The need for triage. You can't investigate everything. You make an assessment about what will pan out and what won't. Here, my call to Dwight Smith ended up as due diligence, not much more. Unlike Dwight Smith, Shelby Don Harris was mentioned on the tape. Shedlick contacted the Harris family, Don, Jeanette, and two young children, and brought them to Raleigh from their home in Tennessee to discuss the case in the 1980s. Back to the video. I had two sessions with Shelby Don Harris, one lasting maybe six hours. When he first came into my office, he denied any knowledge of Helena Stokely, Greg Mitchell, or anybody. As we progressed in questioning, he admitted he knew Helena Stokely. He eventually said he knew Greg Mitchell. Little by little, he began to tell me things. He was very nervous. He excused himself no more than about 100 times to go to the men's room. When I asked him what was wrong, he said he was quite nervous. And so I put it straight to him. I told him what I had read about him and what I thought about him. He denied it. He told me at the time of the McDonald homicides he was AWOL, and he was hiding out because he was involved in drugs. After he had told me that, he became extremely excited. I tried to allay his fears so we could continue talking, but he wouldn't go any further. At the conclusion of the interview, he said to me, If I had a million dollars, I would tell you the whole story. Harris ran off, flew out of Raleigh, and went back to Tennessee. Harris died in 2008. I contacted his widow, Jeanette Harris, through Facebook. I would gladly tell you about the conversation between Mr. Shedlick and Don, but I was not in the meeting. I can tell you what I know from what he shared with me. He made it a point not to know anything more about the McDonald murders than he had already heard. He was given a copy of the Fatal Vision book by someone. 
I'm not sure who, but they suggested he read it. He refused, insisting the less he knew, the better. He did eventually read the book and felt nothing pointed to him, not even Helena's fabrications. Don Harris was a man of honor. He was a Special Forces combat soldier, a soldier's soldier. He was not a man that would ever harm a woman or a child. As for Captain MacDonald, my understanding from Don was that he never met the man. Best regards, Jeanette Harris. One more inconclusive lead. The tape goes on and on. Five hours. Shedlick was obsessive, determined, and decent. A detective not motivated by pecuniary interest, but rather by a desire to find things out. To determine the answers to the most difficult question. What is true and what is false? What really happened? The sadness of it, the futility of it, is that at the time of these investigations, the courts had already lost interest. The judges were looking for reasons to ignore the Stokely material, not revisit it. Shedlick continued his investigations until he died of lung cancer in 1989. It is a quixotic story, and a moving one. Ellen Danley kindly sent a copy of her father's letter for the parole board on McDonald's behalf. The letter is dated December 29, 1988. It was delivered to the parole board after he died. This is the concluding paragraph. I respectfully ask that you show compassion and mercy in reviewing this case when Dr. McDonald comes before you for parole consideration in 1991. I strongly urge his release at the earliest possible time. My investigation clearly points to his innocence and confirms his basic integrity as a caring, compassionate human being. He is not a threat to society. To the contrary, his entire career has been one of extraordinary compassion in his chosen field of emergency medicine. Anyone who has evaluated his past has concluded he is a positive force in our society, not a negative one. Respectfully, Raymond R. Shedlick, Sr. Chapter 47 The Almost Inescapable Conclusion and that would be the end of it. Or the beginning. The writing on the wall might have been gone, but Greg Mitchell felt the need to carry on confessing. In 1984, as McDonald's defense attorneys were preparing yet another appeal, Norma Lane, a friend of Mitchell, called the FBI. They didn't return the call. Then she called Brian O'Neill, and he called Ray Shedlick. Lane's husband, Bryant, told Shedlick the story. In 1982, before Greg Mitchell entered the hospital where he died in June 1982, Greg called me by telephone and told me he wanted to speak with me about something. He said he did not want to talk on the telephone, however, as he believed his phone might be tapped. I agreed to meet with Greg, and we did meet, and when we met, he was very pale and visibly upset. I began the meeting by asking Greg what the trouble was, and he told me, It's something that happened back when I was in the service. If they find out about it, I'm going to have to leave the country and live in Haiti or something. Greg did not tell me anything specific about what happened. He told my wife that he was guilty of a crime that happened a long time ago at Fort Bragg, and that he was concerned about being prosecuted. Norma added, when I read the news story in the Charlotte Observer about the Fort Bragg murders, in which Greg Mitchell's name was mentioned, I realized that what Greg had told my husband and me was that he had taken part in the murders. I contacted Dr. Jeffrey McDonald's lawyers at that time. Lane's story supported the story Mitchell's widow had told Shedlick on March 28, 1983. Two weeks before Greg died, he was visited by the FBI agent George Battles. He became very worried and started to sleep with a gun by him. When it became clear that the Lanes' statements were going to be used by the defense, then the FBI got involved. On May 23rd, Special Agents Brendan Battle from the Charlotte office and Raymond Butch Madden from Raleigh came to Charlotte to take a statement. McDonald's attorneys made a motion for a new trial in 1984, based on all the new evidence substantiating the Stokely claim, and introducing the parallel claims of Greg Mitchell and Kathy Perry Williams. Again, it fell to Judge Dupree to determine McDonald's fate. 
He reviewed the statements taken by the FBI. None of them changed his mind. Dupree wrote in closing, Elena Stokely, Kathy Perry Williams, and, to a more limited extent, Greg Mitchell were drawn to the case and have contributed to a factual charade which has allowed it to continue for more than a decade and a half. Their confessions have been shown to be unbelievable, and even with the affidavits offered to corroborate the statements, if the government were again called upon to present its evidence at a new trial and MacDonald was able to put all, or even selected, parts of his new evidence before a second jury, the jury would again reach the almost inescapable conclusion that he was responsible for these horrible crimes. I am not so sure. Five years passed. In 1989, Norma Lane saw her statement for the first time. The FBI had taken her statement, but apparently Mrs. Lane was not asked to verify or sign it. She felt compelled to correct it. I find the following inaccuracies and misrepresentations in Mr. Madden's affidavit regarding Greg Mitchell's admissions to me. In section 30 of Mr. Madden's affidavit, he writes, She concluded that Mitchell had been involved in the murders and noted that this was purely an assumption on her part. This is not true. I did not say this. I read about the murders, learned that Greg Mitchell had been implicated, and I remembered that he told me that he had done something horrible at Fort Bragg for which the FBI was after him. Mr. Madden's word assumption is his word, not mine. The general content and tone of Mr. Madden's affidavit seems designed to discount and discredit what I actually told him. In Shedlick's statement from April 1984, Bryant and Norma Lane come across as concerned friends of a guilty man. In the FBI statements, made less than a month later, Norma Lane is a confused attention seeker with nothing to say. And so, once again, the intruders disappear. One really bad ruling deserves another. McDonald's attorney, Brian O'Neill, filed a motion insisting that Dupree should have recused himself because James Proctor, his former son-in-law, had been heavily involved in pursuing McDonald after the Article 32. The request was denied. Dupree gave his reasons. The indictment was not returned until almost four years after Jimmy Proctor left the United States Attorney's Office and over two and one-half years after he had ceased to be my son-in-law. Moreover, the reinvestigation of the case had nothing to do with Proctor's activities. Proctor personally believed that MacDonald had committed the crimes, but any statement he may have made expressing this personal conviction appears to have fallen upon deaf ears. Proctor, so secure in his rectitude, felt that it was time to give an interview to his hometown newspaper, the Fuquay Varina Independent. The article appeared on November 28, 1984. Here's an excerpt from the article. Proctor was deeply involved in the investigation of the McDonald case from the beginning. An assistant attorney in the Eastern Division of North Carolina and chief of the Criminal Division, he personally supervised the Fayetteville Division. Proctor talked to Helena Stokely, once considered a possible suspect. He had her take a polygraph test, which she passed successfully. Stokely was given a polygraph test, which she passed successfully. But it was a polygraph test in which she admitted to being in the McDonald house that night. In Brizantine's phrase, Stokely was convinced in her mind that she was there. The article continues. He said the investigators were also satisfied that she had a credible alibi. They talked to people who knew where she was that night. MacDonald had said the murders were committed by a band of hippies, and Miss Stokely was questioned because of her hippie lifestyle. Stokely was questioned because she answered to the description given by MacDonald and Ken Micah, and she subsequently confessed to being in the house that night, many times. She had no alibi for that night. But the best part of the article is Proctor's claim that MacDonald not only staged the crime, but the Article 32 hearing as well. Proctor said the defense attorneys did a superb job of public relations, of staging scenes, as one intended to indicate MacDonald was being mistreated by MPs and then calling the press. They were saying the tall, short, skinny, fat guy did it, Proctor said, and they apparently had the public taking it all in for a long time. O'Neill filed another motion for recusal. 
Hadn't Proctor just publicly claimed that he had been involved in the case from the very beginning? It, too, was denied. 